We're here tonight to celebrate the release of Elaine Welteroff's debut memoir, More Than Enough, claiming space for who you are, no matter what they say. I finished reading her book this week, and I can say that I closed the book with a reminder that what is for you is for you, and nothing can get in the way of that. This message is also reflected through Elaine Welteroff's career. Before she, began the, before she became the author of More Than Enough, she was the youngest editor-in-chief of Teen Vogue magazine and the first African-American to be director of beauty and health at Condé Nast while she was editor-in-chief at Teen Vogue. And I'm sure many of you know, she was a judge on the latest season of Project Runway. Hopefully you enjoyed the season finale that aired last Thursday. Our moderator tonight is activist, writer, and educator, Brittany Packnett. Brittany served as vice president of the National Community, National Community Alliances for Teach for America. She is a co-founder of Campaign Zero and a member of President Barack Obama's 21st Century Policing Task Force. Please give a warm welcome to Elaine Weltroff and Brittany Peckman. Did I go first? Yeah. <laughs> Why does this feel like church a little bit? <laughs> I feel like I'm about to give you guys some announcements. <laughs> All right. I'm going to read you a little passage from my book. This is from chapter 18 called Lemonade. From all of my closed-door talks over the years with successful people of color, female leaders, young innovators, and especially black female bosses, it seems there is a universality to some of the challenges we face in the workplace. We all come up in a world that is set up to make us feel that we are not enough. So we strive even harder to earn respect. We put in the overtime, we bend history, and we stretch ourselves thin to reach and exceed the expectations of the powers that be. We rise to every occasion, we strive for excellence, because that is what black women do. We take what we can get, and we make magic happen. We make lemonade. When we achieve it, we are often told we are too much. Threatening, intimidating, and idle. Bossy. We are told we take up too much space in the room. We are asked to tone it down, to be grateful, I heard all of these things directed at me, either to my face or behind my back, in the stormy months leading up to and following my big promotion. The higher up we get, the more apologies we are expected to make for our power. It can feel demoralizing, exhausting, and unfair. At times, your very existence and survival in these spaces can feel like an impossibility. But the tactics used to keep us small are nothing new. For generations, women, black women especially, have been overworked and underpaid, overlooked and underestimated. And, to paraphrase the great Maya Angelou, still, like there we go. Hey, sis, how you hey, doing? Hey, sis, let's get into it. <laughs> I mean, I'm saying I was like waiting for the amens and the mm hmm. I know. I was feeling that. I, I was feeling that all the way. 100%. I just dove into the deep end. They weren't ready. <laughs> they didn't know. They just didn't know. Well, I mean, let's keep diving in, right? I mean, this is an incredible day. Thank all of you for being here. Um, by the way, the most beautiful room. It really is. The most beautiful book tour stop <laughs> I think that this place has ever seen before. I'm with it. I'm with it. It is absolutely divine in here. Um, and this book is such a laying bare of a journey that is a practice in courage, right? Um, and so many of the things that you have accomplished outwardly clearly take a lot of courage. But there was a lot of inner work and a lot of 
um, hard moments and difficult moments and deep moments and surprising moments and exhilarating moments that brought you to this place and that will take you to the next ones. But you talk about in the passage that you just read, the words of our grandmother matriarch, Maya Angelou, mm -hmm. still like air we rise. And I want to ask you to start the conversation off. What is the blessing of the rise and what's the responsibility of the rise? Mm. By the way, she was raised by preachers. <laughs> so we really are. <laughs> she is really taking us to church right now. <laughs> um, so and I'm going to join you because I was raised in church. So I'm comfortable here. Let's do it. Um, so the responsibility of the, of the rise. Mm -hmm. I think of this acronym that Shonda Rhimes talked about in her book, Year of Yes, which is F-O-D, First Only Different. And I really identify with that. And I'm sure so many of us in the room know what it is to be first or the only one of you in the room and have been made to feel different or like an outsider in different ways um, throughout your life. And I think I have learned on my rise that all of those things that made me feel different, that made me feel less than um, throughout my childhood and, and even coming up through the ranks in corporate America were actually my superpowers. Mm -hmm. Those were actually the things that make, that uniquely equipped me to do work that only I could do in those spaces. The fact that I was the youngest, the fact that I was the only black woman, the fact that I was, um, you know, the, a woman who was actually someone uh, that could lead other women, mm -hmm. I think in an environment that uh, is sometimes catty and competitive. And um, we've all seen Devil Wears Prada. We know what we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say that. <laughs> um, and I think all of those things really equipped me to mm -hmm. actually lean into what I call my zone of genius. And I think we all have a zone of genius. Mm -hmm. And I, I define that as work that only you can do. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, the, the problem is, or that the challenge is that when you are first only or different, there's a pressure um, to conform and to assimilate that comes with that. And it's human, it's natural. No one wants to be different. No one wants to feel like an outsider. And so sometimes we code switch and we conform and we shrink and we pull our hair back and we lower our voice and um, we don't tell our stories. We don't show up fully. And and we think we need to do that to get credibility and to, you know, establish a sense of authority. But the truth is that you're, you're, you're denying your magic when you do that. And so what's... So I think the responsibility of being first only different, the responsibility that you have on, on the rise is to represent authentically for all the people who've never had that opportunity before. And um, and yet, you know, that pressure, that responsibility is also an opportunity. It is an opportunity. That is a unique value add that you bring. And especially in a world like this one, more and more industries are requiring and needing our voice. It's, a, it's you know, in terms of diversity and inclusion in particular, that's a conversation that now we're having at Agnosium, and we know what it means. We know that it's, these are more than buzz terms. These are business imperatives. And so we all have a big, like a chip in us. We all have this magic chip in us, but we need to figure out how to activate it, and it isn't easy, and there are no formulas for it. And for us, we can't really look to our mothers and our aunts and our, the generations that came before us because we're charting new territory. And so we have to look left and right. And and that's part of the reason that I decided to write this book now. Because I think there's an urgency to storytelling as a young black leader. We don't have enough role models. We don't have enough people who've done this, who've paved different paths in different industries, and who can tell the story now. Um, and, and so that there was an urgency to this. Yeah, and demystify that happened, right? Yeah. People to think that it's impossible to take. I think... For those of us who follow you on social media or we've seen you on Project Runway, I hope everyone watched the finale this last week. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we think you maybe were born this way, right? That, that you didn't actually have to take any kind of path or bust any barriers um, because you're always so fabulous, so well put together, so thoughtful, so brilliant. And it's like, well, of course, this must come so easily to you. Mm. You read this book and you realize, no, girl, it took some work. 
just like everybody else. And yeah. also, here's the thing. I, I take good boomerangs, you know, and I, <laughs> I think that we, have, we live in this world where we're all watching each other's success stories play out in real time but you're only seeing the prettiest pictures, the filtered images and the pithy caption, or in my case, the boomerang. <laughs> and it makes it all look so easy. And I, I feel like we do a disservice to each other when we don't tell more of the truth. And I don't want to paint this picture as like, you know, this, is, this book is triumphant. That's right. This book is, this is a liberation story. But I think, um, you know, I just feel like, in, you know, if I am going to be held up as a trailblazer, mm -hmm. I don't want to be a remembered as like a, that token black hire. I want to be someone who is making sure that that trail is left with signposts that make it easier and less daunting and less isolating for the next generation that's coming up behind me. I feel like that's the responsibility that comes with being in this position. That should get an amen. <laughs> yeah, are they alive here? Are they alive? Right. <laughs> Thank you. So, like a choir director. So, right. So, um, so, obviously, imperative to figuring out what the trail is going to be uh, is actually figuring out what your passion is, right? What your purpose is. And this is, again, a word that has been thrown around ad nauseum. Oh, my gosh. And we haven't really demystified this or helped people understand what the calculus of this is. And you and I were together a few months ago in Florida, and we did a program in Someone asked this question, which I'm sure they probably do at every stop you ever make, and how do you find your purpose? Yeah. And you talked about taking a journey backward. Can you talk a little bit about how exactly you identified your purpose, your passion? Yeah, okay, so my least favorite question throughout my whole life has been, what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, and, I, and also, when I was in college, I hated when people asked, what's your passion? <laughs> it's just like, in, in, and we ask children these questions. At like 10, it's like, I'm 10. Right. How am I supposed to know? They're like, right now my passion is Legos. Right, is right. I know. Barbies are my right. thing. Um, <laughs> and I just think we put so much pressure on each other to have a, an, an impressive answer to that question. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's actually detrimental because it ultimately makes kids decide how to impress you with an answer to a question that's going to define them for the rest of their lives or at least set them on a path. Um, and I just, I hated that question. So I had to reframe the question for myself. And that, the way that I reframed it was, what makes me feel alive? Mm -hmm. And when's the last time I felt alive? Mm -hmm. When's the last time I felt like I was doing something that I, I could just do all night long if my mom let me? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, you know, looking back, I, I had a really, it took me, it, it took me time and it was very hard for me to figure out the answer to the question, what is your passion and what do you want to do with your life? Um, and I took that question very seriously. I dug really deep. I did a lot of soul searching. I, how many of you guys have ever experienced, I call it in the book, the college crisis, <laughs> that existential crisis that hits you at the end of college if you have the privilege of going to college. And it's like, you go your whole life and there's a track. And if you're an ambitious person, you're like, Okay, so it's A through F. I'm gonna get an A, and then okay, you, okay. There's there are measurements of success, mm -hmm. so you aim for the highest and you achieve it. And then it's like at the end of college, no one ever tells you that it literally feels like you're standing at the edge of a cliff, mm -hmm. looking down into the black hole abyss, yeah. and then someone's about to come push you off, mm -hmm. and you don't know where you're going, <laughs> and, and 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 down there nobody pays your bills, and you don't know where you're gonna live, and yeah, yeah, totally. So it's extraordinarily daunting, and I think we need to open up conversations around that. I don't know why we don't talk to college students about that. Um, and by the way, not just college students. That existential crisis happens again and again and again and again. And again. So the earlier we figure out how to and cope, again. <laughs> and then after that. Right. Um, and so I think the earlier we feel like the earlier we figure out how to navigate anxiety around these things, the better. And so. Um, I, re I remember during my soul searching period in my college crisis, I looked back and I thought about how I played as a child. Mm -hmm. And I remembered being like five years old in, in that time. And that's usually when your mom's reading you stories. But instead, I would spend that time having imaginary interviews with like 
like luminaries. I would pretend to be Barbara Walters <laughs> or Oprah. And then I would interview like Michael Jackson or Elizabeth Taylor. And we would talk about all this deep stuff, multiple divorces, near death experiences. And like, it would get so dramatic in there. And, 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 and then I think about like in like maybe fourth grade, I had my own magazine where I would draw women in fashion and then I would glue stick them onto a piece of paper and then I would wrap the paper in saran wrap. Oh, for, for the, the gloss. glossy feel. <laughs> I was enterprising. I see you. And also low budget. <laughs> I like to I like to think I'm scrappy. <laughs> and then and then I had this like, backyard salon with my girlfriend and we were the only two brown girls in our neighborhood and and in this cul-de-sac of all white girls and we weren't we wanted to be friends with them. We just didn't really have an in, so we decided we would make a salon. And so we went around door to door and asked them to give us their extra cardboard because we were building a salon. And they could come soon, but it's still in progress. And so <laughs> in under construction. And so we would take these like oil spilled, like old cardboard, you know, cardboard piece of paper or pieces of cardboard. And we would build a salon and we then, you know, we, we, we would steal like her mom's old uh, sheets and hang them in between the, the, the little areas where you get your hair done, your nails done, and whatnot. And, I mean, it was... I love it. I kind of want to go to the salon. I mean, it's kind of great. <laughs> and her mom would come and get a, hair, a head massage and a hand rub between, like, <laughs> dishwashing and laundry. And then, um, one by one, the white girls started to come over and they became our patrons. Not that money was exchanged. <laughs> <laughs> but we earned respect. There you go. And, and, um, we even, it's so funny because my aunt Janet, who was like my role model had a hair salon. It was called Black Heritage, H-A-I-R, Heritage. And she would always have, she was like my epitome of like what a, what a, a boss woman looks like and how she moved. She drove a Jaguar and she had a, I would always like look in her purse and see if she had cigarettes in there, but she would never let me serve smoke. So when I, in my salon, we made our own cigarettes. <laughs> and, and then at lunchtime, we would go around the corner and we would just light them up and like, and like live our best lives. We were just, and it's so funny because I look back and I'm like, I was always a boss. Yeah. I was always, you know, enterprising. I was always an entrepreneur. I was always going to be a magazine editor. I just did not know that job title even existed. I didn't know anyone who dreamed big enough to move to New York City. I came from a small town, and I just didn't, I never, I never saw myself in the pages of magazines other than Essence and Ebony, and so, so I just never dared to dream that big. And there's this stat that I read um, that actually inspired the title of the book, and it said that, that young girls in America, their confidence peaks at age nine, which was so heartbreaking for me and and yet at the same time when I thought about my own trajectory I recognized that it was actually not that surprising and I thought about the women around me as well and I thought about that nine-year-old girl who, who was running stuff mm -hmm. I won't say because you know, we in church right now um, <laughs> and and then I was like what happened to that girl but what happens is the world starts to chip away at that unbridled confidence mm -hmm. and that sense of limitlessness mm -hmm. and you get told we learned that we're black you don't come into the world with an understanding of where we sit and, and some sort of racial hierarchy, you're told and you're, those messages are being enforced and it starts to limit the way you see me. And so I, I realized when I was during, going through my college crisis that I needed to excavate like, who I really was underneath all of that stuff that had piled on top of that, that unbridled confidence that I had, that I was born with. And so I think that the lesson for, for me was to, when you're lost, when you're feeling like you're lost about which way to go and, and you don't have a clear vision, I think it's time to look back and look at where you've been, look at where you started. And there are always crumbs that will lead you to where you're meant to be. And I think, you know, I certainly did for me. And so I think, it, and it reminded me as well that the answers are always inside and I think so often our inclination is to go outside of ourselves to ask for answers to we seek value outside of ourselves mm -hmm. in job titles that sound sexy to other people and salaries that make us feel worthy in relationships 
that make us feel like we're like we matter when really it's all of that stuff is inside and I don't mean to sound like cliche or preachy but it's just the truth and when you're lost you need to reclaim those truths so hold on to that relationship thing because we're going to come back to some juicy stuff in this book though. but I want to when you talk about the limits that other people try to put on you right you, you experience, we experienced that growing up experienced it during college you also experienced a lot of that in your career though so I'd love if you t- could tell us a story or two of other folks trying to put that on you and how you found your limitlessness. Mm. I mean, we could talk about Lily, the intern, if you want. Oh, we want to go there. You know, she was fascinating. She was fascinating. So it's so funny. So I, okay, so I found myself in this place where I was like, okay, I'm trying to figure out my career path. Here's what I know. I know that I like to write. I know that I have a strong aesthetic. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a strong visual sense, and um, I'm, I love storytelling, and I'm interested in psychology and people. And so I was like, advertising, that makes sense to me. Like, that's a steady paycheck. <laughs> um, and so I landed in, I, I got this internship through an organization. If anyone's interested in, in advertising, I, I, before I bash this the experience, I want you to know this is a great organization. <laughs> <laughs> It's called the Multicultural Advertising Intern Program, and I would not be in New York without it. It offered me the opportunity to fly to New York to get paid for an internship. They offered room and board, mm-hmm. um, and I was placed at this very sexy advertising agency called Ogilvy, Ogilvy and Mater. But I will tell you, from the day I started, I felt like I was atrophying. I felt like I was shrinking. I felt like I was becoming invisible. No one looked at me. No one gave me eye contact. In meetings, I I actually sometimes wondered if anyone could see me, and it was the most it was the, the, it was odd for me because I grew up in a predominantly white neighborhood. I was used to being the only one or one of few on all my sports teams and all my classrooms, but this was different. You know, I grew up in liberal Bay Area. You know, we all go ride the whip in the Bay. It doesn't matter what color you are. You know, there's a certain culture that we all subscribe to. There was a certain you know middle class existence that we all that we all had, and, and, and yet I, coming to New York, moving into advertising, introduced me into to what I call in the book, East Coast Whites. Yeah. You know, this is, this is a different, this is a different thing. I know what she's like, talking about. Ivy League, you know, I, no, I call it um, a different kind of white. That's what I call it. Um, and, and it just, it was, it, what, what it really was, um, and I would soon learn that this also applies to black folks as well, which I call bougie blacks, that I, I met those a little bit later, but this, this sort of like, social stratification that's based on status and wealth and generational wealth. It's a whole other beast I had never encountered. And so I'm in this internship group with Lily, who is the self-appointed leader of our group, and she is really confident. And and um, so much so that at the end of the internship, and this, by the way, is an internship that sent me home crying multiple times. I called my mother and just in tears and not because I was homesick. I've never had a nostalgic connection to home. It was because I felt so, um, so much like an outsider there that I lost my, I lost my voice. Mm -hmm. It was like, I was the senior class president back home. I was, I was a higher achiever always top of my class, but there I just felt like I, I, I I couldn't even identify with any of those things anymore. I completely felt like I lost myself. And so anyway, I, I pushed back. I tried to stand out. I tried to do the best job I could. And by the end of the internship, on the last day, Lily says in front of the whole group, she goes, Elaine, one day when I'm the president of my company, I would totally hire you. And I'm like, and like internal dialogue <laughs> is like, how do you know I'm not going to be hiring you one day? <laughs> and but here's the thing. We're not actually hiring Lily. Let's see. Right. <laughs> Yeah, Lily didn't, wouldn't get the job. Mm-hmm. But but it was those kinds of messages that just, and, and all I did, because I had spent, you know, the whole summer atrophying into a smaller yeah. version of myself, I just smiled. Mm-hmm. But it felt, like a, it felt like a dagger. And that's just one kind of example, one small example of microaggressions and what they look like mm-hmm. and what they feel like. And, and everyone in this room has experienced microaggressions probably every day of your life and yet what we when we talk about racism we talk about it in um in these sort of black and white and in really exaggerated ways that 
are really not the experience that we have in corporate America day to day. I think we usually experience them in these in these sort of smaller and, and sometimes what they are well intentioned white people and they're unconscious of what the, of how the interactions are affecting us. But I think we need to be able to create spaces where we can have these conversations because what happens over time when you when you feel as though you're not empowered enough to speak up or to push back or to acknowledge these things straight up, um, it builds up into rage. Yeah. And um, and then they, no one knows why you're so mad. <laughs> and then you're the angry black girl. And then you're like, oh, I can't win. So I saw a hand clap back yes. there. A hand clap of praise right here in the corner. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, keep going. Yeah. You're absolutely and right. Be, I think because of the because the, these things are invisible, they're they're nuanced. They're not easy to call out. They're not easy to point out. Mm -hmm. You know, it's also really important to have a tribe of of women and not just women. There's men in here but a tribe of people of color who are in a similar journey who can see you mm -hmm. and who can get it and who can mm -hmm. say, I've been there. Mm -hmm. And also it's why we have black Twitter because that's also where sometimes, sometimes we do the, 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 the mathematics in the moment. We're like, Hmm, is this worth <laughs> me going there now? <laughs> Probably not. I'm just going to talk about this. On, I'm just going to dump this onto black Twitter later and get retweeted. <laughs> and someone's going to feel me there. Yeah. Yeah. Find community. Yes. Yeah, safe spaces. Yes. Yes. So, so I want to fast forward down your career a little bit. So um, you go from advertising into fashion and journalism, spend time in Ebony Magazine. You eventually come to this point where you are making history, right? You, there is nobody, literally nobody before you who sat in the seat of editor-in-chief of Team Vogue that looked like you were in the that came from. Um, and clearly, this was a moment when the magazine took a real transition, right, that I know is intentional. Um, two issues of justice, two issues of race, to so all of those taboo, hot button topics that you're never supposed to talk about, um, especially in fashion, right? Especially in this world. But you decided to take that turn anyway. And that turn was not without bump. So we talked about Black Twitter. There were times when Black Twitter was coming for Team Vogue's neck, honey. Mm -hmm. And you were, it was not a, the kind of community moment that you were hoping for. What, um, do you mind talking about that a little bit and what you learned about what it means to, to be the first, the only, the different in such a public space? Yeah, I mean, I think it comes with a responsibility and opportunity, like I said, but also um, there is this false expectation that we walk in knowing how to use our voice to advocate for our people mm -hmm. right out of the gates. Mm -hmm. Like, we've gone through some underground training on diversity and inclusion, <laughs> and, like, and like we come just built in with this knowledge of how to talk about sensitive matters around race mm -hmm. and inclusion and diversity in, in eloquent ways that won't offend other people and that will, you know, adequately represent the community. Like, this stuff takes time to learn. Yeah. And so it's interesting. I think most people... Um, you know, know me best from my time as editor in chief of Team Vogue, but I entered into Team Vogue as the beauty director mm -hmm. at 25, and I was coming out of a what I call in the book like assimilation syndrome, where I was at Glamour magazine and just which was off the heels of Ebony, and so get, going from black media to white media was very difficult. And once I got there, I was just trying to keep my head down, do the job, learn the rules, not make any waves. And then by the time I got hired at, at Team Vogue, and all this sort of happened rather quickly, um, I was going to go in the same way I had been operating until that moment of seeing my name in headlines and seeing, feeling like, okay, I was just a girl. I'm just a girl who worked hard to get a dream job. But suddenly overnight, I've become a black girl who's making history. And so it completely reframed my responsibility. It, free, it completely reframed the way I thought about this role and how I needed to step into it. Um, and so sort of that was the moment where I recognized all those things that I was trying to push away and all the distract from, it's like, the reality is my race is going to walk into the room before I do, no matter what kind of code switching and what my ideas may be in this, it doesn't matter. And so let me embrace that and let me use that as, um, my superpower. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, but it, but it didn't, it, it's like, there's this, there's this notion almost that like, we talk about woke, which by the way, woke means taking that, that term, <laughs> but, but we, but we think of woke like a light switch, like you just, you just wake up and, and turn the light switch on and you woke, yeah. but it doesn't work like that. It's a 
process of awakening. And, and DeRay um, says that he has this quote, and I, I quote him in the book. He says, um, you aren't born woke. There are moments, for all of us, there are moments of awakening, even for us. Mm -hmm. And so I think even especially for us, because we've been conditioned to follow the rules. Mm -hmm. And, and, and um, so anyway, when I was at Team Vogue, I, I had the opportunity to use beauty as a platform for, you know, uh, celebrating diversity and inclusion and for pushing forward conversations that were more culturally resonant and or, you know, about culture, really, yeah. celebrating different cultures. And um, ultimately, the change happened story by story, higher by higher, day by day, battle by battle, some won, some lost. And just like anyone else, I made mistakes along the way and I, that I had to make in order to learn, in order to do better. And one of the mistakes, I think this is what you're referring to, but like the great story is... Yeah. Y'all came for me. Someone in this room came for me. <laughs> so I'm going to try to tell the story quick. The long, the whole story is in the book. But so I, here I am. I'm I'm at Teen Vogue. I am. I, I've been there now for a couple of years. I've really built up a sense of credibility, mm -hmm. and I I know that this this is the story I want to write. That's really for the culture. So my one of my best friends is in the room. Chloe, where are you at? She's way back there. So Chloe and I went to um, uh, Rwanda and Ethiopia. It was my first time in Africa. Uh, both of us are mixed race, and my dad is black. My dad is white. My mom is black. And this was the first time that I've gotten the hair braided, and um, it was a really special experience for me, just connecting with my roots in this way through beauty. And so, and then, to, and then to come back to corporate America with these braids that were down to here. And the experience. The long ones always trip them up. Long ones really, really long. Trip and at that and at that point, <laughs> the thing was my hair, my real hair. I had chopped off all my hair after a breakup, and and so I was in the grow out phase. <laughs> That's what we do. That's yeah. what we do. It was a Britney moment, and then and and so I, my hair was like this long, and the and and all of the beauty editors that I would see every week at all of these market appointments would they know what my hair looks like? It's this long. So then I came back with hair this long. And and someone who shall not be named, but it, who is a bona fide beauty expert, says to me, "Oh wow!" Reaches out, pets them, and says to me, "Wow, your hair grew so fast!" Is all and then whispers, leans in, and whispers, "Is all of this yours?" And I just oh, my thought, just started itching. Keep going. I just thought. I mean, that's inappropriate in any work environment, but we work in beauty. Yeah. And you are a beauty you expert. Know better. If you don't know the difference between three inch curl curls and like right. 19 inch yaki. So connect a lot. Come on. Like, this is just unacceptable. <laughs> and it really taught me that beauty, this was just like, it's a microcosm. But the, it, the larger issue is like, we're both beauty editors. I am expect as a black woman, this. I am expected to know how to apply self tanner even though I will never need it in my lifetime. <laughs> I am expected to know how to use volumizer on oily roots. I have dry curly hair, you know? I don't need that. I am expected to know all about your eccentric beauty, because that's the standard. But you are, have never been required to learn about beauty from the perspective of, of an outsider, <laughs> a minority, from a minority's perspective. And so I thought, I'm going to write this story about how sometimes beauty is a form of activism, especially when it's Afrocentric beauty in white spaces. And um, so I, I referenced Zendaya's experience at the Oscars. We all remember. We won't need to recap that. Um, and Zendaya is also a biracial woman. And I think it was important that it was her that clapped back in the way that she did so articulately and it really schooled people about black hair and the stereotypes and how and how political black hair is. So I write this piece that I'm really proud of, Poland Zendaya, and I talk about, you know, all of these experiences and um, and in the shoot I because Zendaya is sort of the heroine and I am also stories about my experience, I hire uh, or we cast a, a biracial model who's half black and half French. And the shoot goes great. I feel so proud of it. And it goes out into the world. And someone takes a picture, maybe someone in this room, <laughs> <laughs> takes, 
takes a picture of the page with flash on and posts it onto Twitter and says, cultural, Teen Vogue commits cultural, appra cultural appropriation once again. Cultural appropriation at its finest. That person had like 100 followers and somehow all of y'all found him and retweeted, <laughs> retweeted, retweeted, retweeted. And then it got picked up by the Daily Mail. All the way in the UK. All the way in the UK with a headline that said, Teen Vogue publishes anti-black story. Y'all. <laughs> I was like, did anyone even read the story? <laughs> Does anyone even know that a black person wrote this story? Oh my God, here I am <laughs> fighting the good fight, or so I think, for, you know, on behalf of us. And, and it was so utterly misconstrued and at this, and, and it was painful. Yeah. And we do live in cancellation culture where there is zero margin for error, especially for us. And, and already I put my neck out. My team did not, was not un understanding why the story was important, yeah. you know, so for it to, for the backlash to be what it was, was really painful, but there, it turned around. At some point, people were coming for me in my Instagram, you know, captions. Um, and she, the, the model wrote back and said, for anyone who cares to know, I am black and French. And it started to open up a deeper, more nuanced dialogue with other black women around, so is she not black enough to wear braids? Hold on, am I black enough to wear braids, but she's not black enough to wear braids? Let's get deeper, let's go deeper on this. Because black is, blackness is not a monolith. We come in all shades, colors, textures. And so we started to have a conversation where it, I, I started to see one by one women apologizing to this model and to me. And, and, and so it was, it was, but then we started talking about colorism. And I realized my blind spot, you know, here I am thinking that I'm advocating for us by, by centering our beauty in this mag, in a Vogue magazine. And yet, I'm featuring an African hairstyle on a light-skinned girl. And nowhere on that page was a dark-skinned woman. And that's painful. And I, and I learned something that day. And I, I'm so grateful that I didn't allow that moment to stop me because there was so much more work I had to do in the world that, um, that, did, that, that was important and that did resonate in the right way. But I'm... But I remember that, that being really, really, really scary for me. And, and, and ultimately, I was told by my company, just let it die. Like, they'll forget, move on, don't respond, don't respond. I'm like, I cannot go down in history as the girl who did this, <laughs> and people think I don't get it. Yeah. So I wrote an open letter, and I acknowledged it, and I invited a conversation around it, and I shared my perspective and the intention. But ultimately, the takeaway, and I think it applies for all of us, you know, it is it's rarely... It, it, there is your intention and there's your impact. Mm -hmm. and, and and we need to all be, in this woke world, we're all waking up collectively day by day. We need to be responsible and take accountability for the impact of our actions. And I think that was my that was my kind of aha moment. And it, just, it made me a better journalist. It made me a better, more responsible storyteller. Thank you for that vulnerability. Um, both here on the page and in this room. Um, I know we have to get to questions shortly. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to ask two questions and we can do them quickly. Yes. Because I already gave the teaser about this relationship, so I feel like I have to go back there, like yeah. I owe it to yeah. the audience. Yeah. Let's talk about ex-future husbands. Girl. That's literally what he's called in the book, ex Future husband. He's future husband for a second until you like, uh-uh, he's going to be the ex-future right. husband in a second. Because <laughs> you just talked about a moment about, you know, learning in public, right? Which is incredibly difficult and can be very painful. But sometimes we learn in private, right? And we take on these difficult, sure, professional challenges that we've been talking about. But we don't talk, I think, enough and openly enough about all of the ways in which matters of the heart, matters of personal affairs can deeply affect our confidence, can deeply affect whether or not we think we are enough, let alone more than enough. Mm -hmm. An ex-future husband threatens that in some real ways, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I won't give away the story, but tell me what that personal lesson really meant for you in your journey. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it, this goes back to the success stories that we're scrolling every day on social media and the stuff you're not seeing. Mm -hmm. And I think it, this book delves into the stuff that, it, the universal stuff that we all are experiencing but we're not talking about in public discourse. And I think personal relationships 
um, romantic relationships are a part of that because we live intersectional lives and we are all trying to find love while we are on striving for success at the same time. And often um, these two parts of our lives intersect and sometimes it's a crash and explosion. And, you know, and I think we, we, the way that we show up in our romantic relationships often dictates how we show up in our professional lives. And it can often even detour us. And um, it, it's, it, I came very close to not pursuing and not staying on the path that I'm meant to be on because of other relationships. I do talk as well, in addition to future ex-husband. How many of you guys have a future ex-husband? I got okay. like two, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, my actual future husband is Oh, he's the good hey, one. Hey, husband. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wait, I just love that he started a round of applause for, for himself. himself. I'm very into that. <laughs> um, but I also talk about first love. With, yeah. And I, t- I, I title them these things because these are universal. We all yeah. have a first love. We all have a future ex-husband, the one that we thought we were going to marry. Mm-hmm. Um, and, the, and my first love, um, I, he was someone, he was the bad boy archetype. Mm-hmm. And I followed him. I did the one thing that I tell all young girls never to do. I tell parents, never let your daughters do this. <laughs> I followed this boy to college. Why Don't do they, it. Why did they let me do that? Don't do it. Why did they let me do that? <laughs> and I was I was a 4.0 student. I was an athlete. And I, I had my sights set on Stanford my whole life. I didn't even apply to Stanford. I didn't even apply to an Ivy League school. I only applied to Sac State. And that's where I went because first love was going there. Notice he shall not be named. And then, get, then I get there. And guess what? This fool isn't even enrolled. <laughs> so, so you was there all by yourself, all by yourself, looking around. <laughs> so I'm like, <laughs> and I'm doing the math, like, <laughs> wow, they really felt that. Yeah. Somebody went through that. And, and then it gets worse. I don't know if I should tell you this part. Should I tell that what happened? Yes, next? you should. Actually. I promise. I promise we'll get to questions. Then what right happened? Yeah. Then, okay. Then what happened? Then gets to happen. He goes to jail. <laughs> and then I decide to stay with him. So it's all of a lot is going on in this. There's a lot going on in the book. And that's <laughs> and that is in the chapter ride or die syndrome. Yes. Which a lot of us suffer from. Don't leave me out here. Somebody else has gone through this before. You ride or die syndrome is what gives you an ex-future husband. So exactly. Yes. So we know. all of that to say, I share these things <laughs> because I, it is my hope that other young women, other women of any age who see themselves on this page, I hope that in, my, in, in, in me telling my truth, I hope it wakes you up to your truth faster yeah. so we can get out of the car. <laughs> and we can run in the other direction when we need to. Because where are we going and why do we have to die when we get there? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's what I wonder. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to questions. There is a microphone coming around. Wait, wait, wait. We can't just go to questions. No, I'm, I'm going to come back. I promise. No, no. This is how we have a way of doing questions. Oh, yes. Here yes, at, indeed. Here at do. the Black Girl Magic Church. We have a way of. <laughs> <laughs> wait, we should start that. Yeah, it's actually, we're here. Okay. <laughs> Started, yeah, started as a book tour stop. Now we're here. All right. So all of you should have received a card when you got here, when you walked in. Um, and hopefully a pen as well. So if you can't tell, we're a little extra. We don't know how to just do things the normal way. Uh, instead of doing a traditional, we're going to do Q&A. You all will have an opportunity to ask questions. But I invite you to participate in this little interactive group exercise that really brings the spirit of the book to life. Um, the, the subtitle of my book is Claiming Space for Who You Are No Matter What They Say. And so the cards, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna do a little, we're gonna give you an example of how this works. So the card says, I Brittany. am claiming space for my brilliance. No matter what anyone 
may say. Now, the they could be internal, it could be external, it could be a system, it could be a feeling, it could be fear, it could be doubt, it could be an actual person, and you can name them if you want. Um, so if, we, if, you, if you wouldn't mind, let's take just 60 seconds of silence to reflect, fill out the card, and then when you're ready to ask your question, if I just ask you to read, the, read your card and introduce yourself through this card first, and we'll go from there. So 60 seconds on the clock. It's also good for an uh, for a photo op. Right. Really. All right. Okay. Sixty seconds. You can. Let's you can do it. Yeah. You can call it. Yes. All right. She's ready. I know. And I'm so nervous. <laughs> Don't be nervous. Don't be nervous. No. That means we're all family. <laughs> yes. Okay. So I, Jasmine, am claiming space. For Wait, we can't hear you, oh. Jasmine. Okay. I, Jasmine, am claiming space for mental and emotional strength and clarity, no matter what my anxiety may say. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so you spoke to unlearning limited thoughts, limiting thoughts, behaviors, um, this title, soul snatchers. And I want to know, like, what more can we or should we be doing to challenge ourselves to overcome those feelings of not being worthy or not being confident enough to claim our space in certain rooms, especially when we're, we're later on in our lives and in our careers and we've already kind of taken on, we've already stretched ourselves to to feeling like we're not capable of being in certain rooms. We've already kind of, you know, created that mold for ourselves. How do we get out of, of feeling like we are limited? I invite you to come into this. By the way, I didn't write it in my book, mm -hmm. intentionally, mm -hmm. because I think that the way that we all learn best is through storytelling. Mm -hmm. And I, like I, I said before, and I, I really mean this, I think that there are universal gems locked up in the stories women never tell. And when we tell the truth, it wakes up the truth in other women. Mm -hmm. And so, um, that being said, I'm not a yama. You know what I'm saying? I can't fix, I can't fix your life or your career. Yeah. <laughs> but I can, I can offer what I've been through. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that for me, Everything is spiritual. Mm -hmm. So when I come against, um, my mom always says, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And so when I come against what feels like a weapon mm -hmm. that is threatening to keep me small, I think of my ancestors. And I, I literally envision them and I invoke them into the space before I enter it. If I'm fearful, mm -hmm. if I'm feeling small, if I'm feeling isolated alone or not it's not in my power. I remember them, and I literally visualize them. And then sometimes, sometimes if that doesn't work, I just scroll through Instagram sometimes, just remember who I'm doing it for and who I'm representing for, and it gives me the strength to actually use my voice and to find it in those moments when I feel like it's lost. Um, and I also think having a mantra, having a prayer that you can go back to that just, re that just puts things into perspective again, um, is really, really key. We did a prayer before we came out here, one that's grounding, um, and I think it's, this book is also filled with lots of them. There's full-page lead quotes that I hope and I invite. If you, if you feel led, like, just rip it out. Keep it with you. Take a picture of it and remind yourself. And one of them that comes to me a lot, that comes up for me a lot, is um, this one quote that says, when the world tells you to shrink, it stands. Mm -hmm. And I think even that just changes your posture. It changes your breathing pattern. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm interested, Pat Yeti, Miss Pat Yeti, what, what advice do you have? I mean, I, you gave such phenomenal thoughts. Um, you, what you were saying reminded me of two quotes that I often think of. One is by a black woman poet. You are thinking about um, entering the space and feeling small to remember that you are actually never alone. And the poet says, I came as one, but I stand as 10,000. Right? Mm -hmm. There are generations of people who sacrifice so much for you to be exactly where you are. Literally envision all of those folks 
surrounding you and giving you all of the strength and the push and the wisdom that you need. The other thing is not, I mean, it's not a poetic because I found it on Instagram, but it's true. Um, <laughs> um, I think about this all the time. It's that I had a purpose before anyone had an opinion. Yep. And I am, I am also a person of faith. And so I believe that I was born into this world destined to do certain things. And I do not serve a God of smallness. So the things that he has destined for me to do are great. They are big. They are massive. Um, and all of that. All of that was in place before you had something to say, before you had something to say, before anybody who didn't orchestrate that plan has anything to say. Mm -hmm. So you had a purpose before anyone had anything to say. Thank you for that question. Hi. First of all, I love you, sis. <laughs> I, Ola, am claiming space for black girls with disabilities, no matter what our ableist society says. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned the other a lot. How do black women with disabilities step out of that outsider identity and normalize disability in fashion and media? Um, we are the majority minority, meaning people with disabilities, we outnumber black people, LGBTQIA people, Latinx people, everyone. So how do we normalize disability in fashion and media? Yeah. We have a lot of work to do. In that regard, and I, can you guys hear me? Bring it back up. <laughs> now you guys tell me. There you go. Um, I think we have a lot of work to do um, in that area, but I can tell you, as someone who spent 10 years of my career in magazine editing in particular, the last five years have completely radically shifted um, the zeitgeist and the responsibility that editors feel when they're pitching stories, and I think. Now more than ever, stories like yours need to be told, and and there's an it's almost like there's an opening in the matrix, and now is the time to go through that. Find like find the editor that you think is the right editor to tell your story, and be relentless. Make a list. Where do you want to see yourself that you don't see yourself currently? Make a list. I really think I believe in the power of writing things down, like committing things to paper. So where, what are the five outlets that you want to see yourself represented in that you aren't? Now, go down that mess head. Who are the five editors that you need to find their email and, and phone number and cold call, email? I will tell you, 10 years ago, I would not give you this advice because no one would ever get back to you, unfortunately. But today, it's different. It really is. And there is this opening. And I think it's, there's an opening for people like you, for people like us, to come through it and to share our perspectives and to pitch our stories and tell the stories that only we can tell. So um, I think it's just about putting together a game plan, really. A lot of our biggest dreams happen when we put pen to paper mm -hmm. and we make a game plan. And also, I'm willing to help you too. So. <laughs> Hi, Elaine. Hi, Brittany. I just wanted to first start off by saying I'm so glad you chose Brittany to be your Q&A host Aww. because that was an amazing choice. I've seen her in person at another event, and she was like a really great person to choose. So for my card, I mean, I didn't have a pen, so I'm going to write it down later. I am saying that I, Jenny, am claiming space to be a clinical neuropsychologist no matter what my inner doubts or any other people may say. Woo! And my question, so when we were on the way here, and I'm really glad that you touched on the braiding situation because I was, um, I saw that go down. And me and my friend in the car were talking about how privilege isn't just a binary thing. Yeah. A lot of people think of it as like whiteness is a privilege and everybody else doesn't have privilege. But we know that that's not true. We know people that are in marginalized communities hold privilege, yeah. whether it's being, um, um, middle class, being able-bodied, being biracial, and I'm glad that you brought that up because my question was, knowing that we all carry privilege, what are some ways that you've had your privilege maybe held against you in your achievements that you've rightfully accomplished, and also, how do you hold your privilege in a way that you use it to make room for people who may not have the same privileges that you have? Mm, that's such a great question. Thank that's you. And 
I'm so I'm so glad that you bring up privilege because it's such a hot button topic right now, and it makes so many people so uncomfortable. Um, and I think in order to make change, we have to be comfortable making people uncomfortable. We have to go there. And and so um, the way I think about privilege is is not having to see discrimination that doesn't affect you. That is privilege. And you're absolutely right. I absolutely agree. We all have a measure of privilege, whether we recognize it or not. And I certainly in my career have... Um, not even in my career, throughout my whole life, I've, been, I've become aware of the privileges that come with being who I am. And, and sometimes they felt like a detriment. They felt detrimental to me. And other times they felt advantageous. And so um, I'll give two quick stories to answer your question. The first one is when I found myself, and I talked about this story in the book, um, when I was at Glamour Magazine, again, I was going through assimilation syndrome at that time. I was one of two black editors. And I remember being mistaken for the only other black editor who was Haitian, <laughs> dark skin, long, straight hair, tomboy, wore like baggy, ripped up jeans every day and was quiet. And we're like, couldn't be more opposite. <laughs> and yet we'd be at these meetings and I'd been there a, a year and it'd be like, Rajni, Elaine. And he'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> we look nothing alike. But then um, I found that, I, so within the beauty department, I was the only black girl, and they decided to media train me as the person who would go out and represent the magazine on television. I think it made them look good. I think I'm good on TV. A little bit, it was the diversity tech, you know, quota. And I had, there was an editor who was senior to me that was bypassed. She wasn't trained. She wasn't media trained. She wasn't invited to be media trained. And it wasn't until years later that we talked about how that made her feel. And she is a Jewish woman. She's plus size. She's, she's curvy. And she felt in that moment that I had pretty privilege and skinny privilege that she didn't have in in, a fa in an industry like fashion that does exalt, you know, rail thin frames. And I really appreciated her sharing that and her being vulnerable. She actually ended up leaving the company because she felt like she couldn't shine in my shadow. And she shared that with me later. And this was the editor who actually opened the door for me to even get that job at, at, at Glamour. This is after I, coming from Ebony, I had done every job at that magazine. I could run circles around anyone at any of these magazine jobs, but could not get a job to save my life. And Holly Siegel reached out to me and said, I want you to work with me. She sent me the edit test. I didn't have to go to HR. I didn't have to go to anyone. She hired me. And yet then she felt intimidated by the way that I, people reacted to me and the opportunities that I got. And it really framed for me that we all feel in some way, shape, or form like we're not enough. And um, it gave me compassion and empathy for her. Um, and it helped me understand this blind spot for me that I didn't even realize I was carrying around this privilege that made other people feel this way at some time, at some certain times. And so, and then the other, and it, the other part of your question is just how can you, a lot of this book is about power and privilege. How we get it and what we do with it. Not just for ourselves, but for our whole community. And, and I think when I arrived at Team Vogue, it was very clear to me that I had a responsibility to represent for all of us. And I knew as well that as a mixed race person, I identify as a black woman and in white spaces, I am a black woman. I am perceived that way and I am treated accordingly. But there is a measure of light skin privilege and white privilege that I have that has given me access to these spaces. And so what I do in those spaces can be revolutionary and it can open doors for so many other, so many of us. And I really felt that responsibility. It, it, it wasn't in the back of my mind, it was at the front of my mind when I came into that, 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 that job. And so all of us, no matter where you're at, no matter, no, matter, no matter where you're at, no matter what table you're sitting at or fighting to be at, you have an opportunity to change the perception. And it's not your job to do that. It is not your job to do that. And I think we need to say that to ourselves again and again and again. Sometimes we feel like we're representing for, yeah, for our entire race. And, and, and that's not fair and we are not a monolith. But we do have an opportunity to bring 
a perspective and an outside voice that would not be there without you. And and I, I took that really seriously at Team Road. And Brittany, is there anything you want to add to that? Okay. Thank you for answering my question. Hi. Um, so I'm very nervous. Um, um, I, Jordy, claim space for my goals, no matter what negative perceptions of my disability they say. So I've worked in the fashion industry now for four years. And my question to you is, do you think that brands and the industry in general, or why do you think brands or the industry in general are so hesitant to authentically embrace diversity, like including disability? As someone who's worked in the industry, I've had, um, I faced a lot of discrimination being disabled or because I am biracial. And I, I, really don't, I really don't understand why brands don't want to really authentically embrace diversity or celebrate diversity. So why do you think that is, like luxury brands or the industry in general? Why do you think that could Yeah, be? I think the, the, the biggest reason is just ignorance. And I think it's a lack of representation behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. I think, again, privilege is not having to see discrimination that you don't, that doesn't affect you. Right. And so I think sometimes the lack of visibility behind the scenes is, I said, you can't change the stories until you change the storytelling. And I think we need more storytellers who look like us, who can bring these perspectives that can raise the consciousness. Um, and that's how the stories change authentically. And so, like I said to her, I mean, I think you have to, unfortunately, the, the onus is on us to make ourselves more visible. Mm -hmm. And I think social media is such an, a fantastic tool that we now have, that I didn't have when I was trying to get in this industry, when I was trying to pitch myself. So um, we just have to be relentless. And we have to make ourselves visible and make sure that our voices are heard. And now more than ever, like I said, this, there is an opening where I think I think that the powers that be in industry, especially media, more, are more receptive um, to these kinds of pitches and these kinds of stories. So you just have to be relentless. Thank you. Thank you for asking that question. Thank you for being there. So we have time for one last question. Really? <laughs> Hi, Brittany. Hi, Elaine. Thank you both so much for who you are and what you do for young black women, women of color in this world. So my card says, I, Shakira, am claiming space for my beauty and power, no matter what people who want me to shrink myself may say. Mm. So this is more of a request than the question, but I have a niece, she's 15, and she's definitely at that age where societal pressure is really starting to encroach upon her sense of identity and beauty, and I come up from a very petite family, and my niece, like me, is very petite, and she's often incredibly hard on herself about being very small. And she says she wants to gain weight to feel more beautiful. And because I'm her aunt, I try to encourage her and, like, affirm her. But she tells me I'm not cool. So <laughs> I think that my encouragement sometimes doesn't carry the same amount of weight. So because you're cool, and Brittany, you as well, I would love if I could just video you encouraging my niece, offering some words of affirmation. Would that be okay? That's an easy yes. <laughs> let's do it in let's do it in the meet and greet after. Let's do it at the meet and greet after. Yes. But yes. But yes, you should come to the front of the line. Yes. <laughs> Can we do one more? I mean, I'm fine with it. Can we push on one more? Of course. It's your show. <laughs> are, are you guys okay with one more? I feel like we're just getting started a little bit, but I mean, you know, church does last four hours. I know. So. I don't know if she's been to black church before. We went a little late, though. So. Sorry. Awesome. Thank you. Second time. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no. I almost feel like that was karma, because when we got up here, I was like, go in front of me. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, Mariah, am claiming space for my unfiltered needs, no matter what men or my schedule may say. Woo! Okay, where's the tambourine? Right. 
Um, and my question to you is... I forgot there was going to be a question after that. Oh, <laughs> it's definitely a question. Um, from one direct woman to another, please share one of the most liberating moments you curated for yourself or someone else, and what fears did you face? That's a question question. That was a question. Go ahead and come through, Mariah Carey, with a question. <laughs> oh, okay. Let me take this one in. Um, you, I love that you use the word curated. A moment of liberation that I curated for myself. Honestly, reading King Book. Do I need to elaborate? <laughs> well, first of all, I'll say it's in the book. But the reason I say that is, is not because that was a negative experience for me. It was the best experience of my life in so many ways and set, the, set me on the path that I'm on now. But I think that, you know, we need to give ourselves permission and we need to give each other permission to, I always say this, your life is a series of dreams realized. You do not have to be defined by one dream to come true. You do not have to be defined by one job title, by one career path, by one relationship. And I, I got to a point where I looked up. I, I was like, okay, I have spent years fighting for a seat at the table. And now it, I'm 29, 30, and I found myself at the head of the table. I never even dreamed that big. And when I looked up and I was, I did everything I came to do. My mission here is accomplished. I did more than I even thought I could do in a short amount of time. And now I want to build my own table. And this is my first table. And I want to invite you guys to come sit at my table. And, it, and, and I think the liberation of walking away from a title and an entity and a corporation that threatened to define me for the rest of my life, or the, my, which didn't adequately define me, which didn't adequately compensate me. Because... <laughs> Not the fans. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. Because here's the here's the here's the part that we don't talk about. We talk about the responsibility that comes with being first, the opportunity that comes with being first, F O D. But we don't talk about the discount that we come at mm. these opportunities with. And I think that part is something we we need to tell more of our stories because I think we don't talk about salary negotiations. We don't talk about how to know our value, let alone advocate for it ourselves. Um, and they're not prepared for us to advocate for ourselves either. Let's be honest. You know, I think, you know, what I read in the beginning, being called entitled, being called bossy, all of these things, they're, they're, they are the underside of a, re a dream realized. And we don't talk enough about that. And I think to be in a position where even with all of that going on, we collectively as a team could do the work that we did that was so transformative that could galvanize a whole generation, new generation of young people who see themselves as activists. To be able to do that work from a place like Vogue in that environment was so gratifying that I knew the value that I had created there was going to have a ripple effect for the next generation and I could leave, I could, I could pass the torch and keep going. And what I, and, and I, this is what I will say, you're, you find your passion. Once, if you're lucky enough to find your passion, the thing to remember is that your passion is multi-platform. And so to be able to move and do what I need to do out in the world for myself, to work for myself, to be able to build my own table, that is true liberation. And that is, that is a moment that I had to curate for myself, and it was not easy. And the story's in the book. <laughs> That was such a good question. I will tell you. Please. You actually probably don't know this. So the second part of your question was what what moments of liberation did you curate for somebody else? And you don't know this, but the story that you told me about deciding to leave Team Vogue is the reason why I made the move that I did. No. Truly. Truly. Yep. Sick. So. I didn't even know that. I didn't know that. Yep. Yep. So... 
We are Makes grateful that you have built this table for us to sup at, dine mm -hmm. at, worship at, fellowship at that you have curated these moments of liberation, Thanks. shared them with us, and given us the opportunity to do them for ourselves. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brittany. Please give a round of applause to Brittany for killing this. I feel so bad there's like a whole line. I really want to hear this one. I think we have to do meet and greet.